this is maybe a shock to some, maybe everyone who's listening. It, given how much people talk and obsess over heart disease, and rightly so, it's the number one killer, you think we would know exactly how an atherosclerotic plaque forms in the first place, but we don't. So the focus on the plaque comes from the, the fact that within, around the heart and what is feeding the heart, it's blood, the, heart, the, uh, the blood that the heart needs for all the heart muscle in order to continue to contract and relax all the time, it, it needs a lot of blood. And those coronary arteries can become blocked with plaques or what's called an atheroma or an atherosclerotic plaque. And we know some of the composition of those plaques we know that there are some fats in there. We know that there are a lot of these things called foam cells, which I will come back to in a great deal because they are likely very important in this process. But despite knowing the composition of these plaques, we don't exactly know what's happening. So that needs to be disclosed right at the forefront of the conversation. Anyone who's speaking about the formation of a plaque is speculating. And if you are hearing someone who's speaking about the formation of a plaque in absolute terms, shut them off because they don't know. They're just speculating and they're speaking with a false authority, which is something I don't want to do. I, I want to be very cautious in speaking about this. So that's why I'm disclosing that up front. We know the composition of the plaque and, and that has led some to erroneously conclude that they know all the process. Now, I'd mentioned these things called foam cells. Foam cells appear to be essential. They are always there at the site of the atherosclerotic plaque. And we think that they are contributing because they are, um, it, it really fits in very, very well together. It helps us bring a lot of these pieces together. And in some instances, actually physically bringing things together. We know that inflammation is a very big part of atherosclerosis. In fact, as much as people obsess over LDL cholesterol and they obsess over it as a marker of heart disease, which is something we've kind of touched on before, LDL is a terrible predictor of heart disease. C-reactive protein, which is a marker of inflammation, actually is a better predictor of heart disease. And, and it might be because of the foam cell. So very briefly, we have these things in, in our bodies called macrophages. Macrophages are kind of the prototypical or poster child immune cell. It's flowing. These are flowing through the blood and they can, they can go into tissues anywhere throughout the body. So you find macrophages all over the body, in the blood and out of the blood within tissues. In the wall of the blood vessels, what can happen is we have a, a macrophage that engulfs an LDL cholesterol. And as it's eating too many of these, it gets fat. And when you look at this fatty macrophage under a microscope, all these big pockets of fat in the macrophage look like air bubbles. In fact, it looks like it's foamy. It's a foamy cell. And that's why they call it a foam cell. So again, a foam cell is a fat macrophage. And as the macrophage is eating these LDL cholesterol molecules, it starts to secrete pro-inflammatory proteins or cytokines like C-reactive protein. So these foam cells appear to be an essential player in the process of, of an atheroma or an atherosclerotic plaque developing. Now that's all kind of background. Now the first study that I wanted to highlight in the metabolic classroom is a study published in 1979 by this legendary pair. And I do mean that. These guys are serious scientists, won the Nobel Prize, Brown and Goldstein. And at the time, they, uh, they were at the University of Texas, uh, San Antonio. And they, I think that's where they were. The, the name of this article is Binding Site on Macrophages that Mediates Uptake and Degradation and, and so on. It's published in the journal PNAS, again, 1979. What they found, the gist of it and why I'm touching on it, is that they would incubate macrophages with LDL cholesterol, native LDL cholesterol. In other words, LDL cholesterol that it was just innocent, normal LDL cholesterol. Indeed, most of the LDL cholesterol that the average person has flowing through the blood. And you couldn't make the macrophage eat or consume or engulf that LDL. They just would sit there and hang out together as good little buddies, you know, sitting at the bar. 
It was only when the LDL molecule, um, the LDL molecule had been altered in some way, and I'll come to that more in a moment, then the macrophage sensed that altered LDL as a problem and engulfed it. So there has to be something that happens to the LDL, not the LDL alone that's the problem. Something must happen to it. One of the key things that happens to it is that it gets oxidized. Now, the next article that I would refer to, and we have links to these, is an article published in 98, and, the, and this is in the journal Cell, and the name of the um, manuscript is uh, Oxidized LDL Regulates Macrophage Gene Expression, etc. And what they found was that when, mac when LDL had these bioactive lipids in it, then the macrophage would consume it. And uh, the bioactive lipids in particular were these molecules called 9 and 13 HODE, H-O-D-E. 9 HODE and 13 HODE. Now, that, this sounds, someone's thinking, oh, Bickman, you're getting, Ben, you're getting way too complex. So I don't, I don't mean to be. But briefly, LDL is a molecule that's basically like a bus that's just carrying around a bunch of fats. And the composition of those fats or the, the type of fats appear to be problematic. And if some of those fats are oxidized, then that LDL molecule carrying those oxidized fats, it now gets sort of flagged as problematic and the macrophage will try to get rid of it. It's because oxidized lipids are very dangerous or also they're referred to as lipid peroxides. They can move through cells and move through membranes and create oxidative stress anywhere throughout the body, including in the mitochondria, and including in the nuclei, you know, which could perhaps result in mutations to genes. So we have these LDL molecules that get enriched with these oxidized lipids, 9-HODE and 13-HODE, and now the macrophages will greedily start engulfing these LDL molecules. It's almost like the macrophage knows this oxidized LDL is so dangerous, and the macrophage's job is to clean up dangerous stuff it is thinking, I'm going to take this for the team. I'm going to engulf these oxidized lipids. It's going to hurt me, but it'll be better than the alternative. And so the macrophage sort of becomes the hero in this sense. But as a person has too much of these oxidized LDLs, the macrophage is losing the war. And so you have more and more macrophages accumulating in an area, more and more oxidized LDL. And we'll come back to how that happens, the oxidized LDL. But then we have what is likely the formation of the core of the plaque. And it's this, this accumulation of these LDL molecules, oxidized LDL, and these foam cells or these macrophages that keep eating it. Now, what's so important about this now, and everything I've been touching on so far is, is very interventional, mechanistic data. We know these things. Here's the first bit of evidence where it's more um, speculative. There's, uh, in 1998, this um, manuscript has the title Strong Increase in Hydroxy Fatty Acids, etc. They found that people with confirmed atherosclerosis had up to 100 times more of these oxidized LDL molecules. So these LDL molecules that had these this 9-hode and 13-hode. So they had 100 times more of this oxidized LDL than people, up to 100 times more than people without atherosclerosis. And remember, these are people with confirmed atherosclerosis. And importantly, these molecules, 9-HODE and 13-HODE, which appear to be the most reactive of all the oxidative, oxidized lipids and appear to be essential in a macrophage pulling in um, this oxidized LDL molecule, they are derived from one particular type of fat. This is an omega-6 polyunsaturated fat called linoleic acid. You do not get these oxidized lipids from saturated fats. You do not get these oxidized lipids from monounsaturated fats. You do not get these oxidized lipids from saturated fats. You do not get these oxidized lipids from monounsaturated fats, which is what most of the natural fats in the human diet consist of. Overwhelmingly, when you look at ancestral fats, coming from animal fats and fruit fats, fruit fats being coconuts, avocados, olives for the most part, they are almost totally uh, saturated and monounsaturated fats. 
And this, so this omega-6 polyunsaturated fat, linoleic acid, it, it exists in nature, but to very, very low levels. We now eat over 50,000 times more of it than we did 100 years ago because it is in every processed food. And that is things like soybean oil, canola oil, corn oil, the so-called vegetable oils. So again, back to the data here. They, they, this study, the next study, and this was published in 2012. And the lead author is Christopher Ramsden at the National Institutes of Health. And the title is Lowering Dietary Linoleic Acid. They actually took people and had them change their diet to cut out, to cut back on linoleic acid, this omega-6 polyunsaturated fat. And they found that the levels of 9-hode and 13-hode, including in the LDL, dropped significantly. So they could directly lower the levels of, of these very reactive oxidized lipids. Importantly, they didn't do it by cutting back saturated fat because saturated fats don't contribute to these. So I'm sort of making the case here that our view on dietary fat has been totally wrong. We vilified saturated fat because saturated fat can, in some instances, increase LDL. But remember, LDL isn't the problem. It's a problem when the LDL is oxidized or it has these oxidized lipids that are almost entirely derived from linoleic acid, which is a polyunsaturated fat. Now, let's continue a little more with the actual mechanistic studies as I'm kind of nearing the end of this topic. There are two studies that I think are very compelling because it is as close as we can come to an actual clinical study, taking people, splitting them up into two groups. And that's what these two studies did. And they followed them for years so this is incredibly uncommon. It would not be done again in, t in t today, in that nowadays, partly because you couldn't get ethical approval for it like they were able to back then in the, in the 60s, which is where these data um, kind of originate from, and they were just sort of rediscovered. So they took people into two groups. One, you eat saturated fat as your primary fat. The other, you eat this um, more polyunsaturated fats from these vegetable oils, so-called. And so the first of these two studies is published in 2016, but it was a reanalysis of data from decades ago, from the 60s. Um, both of these are. The first is called a reevaluation of the traditional diet heart hypothesis. And the other one is, um, uh, the, uh, is the Sydney Heart Study, <clears throat> where it's entitled Use of Dietary Linoleic Acid for Secondary Prevention. Um, now, both of these, what they found was that they had significant groups of people and they had the two groups, they split them up into the two groups that I just mentioned. One group eating more saturated fat, one group eating more polyunsaturated fat, mostly omega-6, linoleic acid. And guess who died the most? It was the group eating the higher amounts of linoleic acid. They had higher overall mortality, so actually died at a higher rate. And then in the Minnesota reanalysis data, they found that heart disease was the same. It wasn't heart disease that was killing them. But in the Sydney um, diet heart study, so this other kind of corresponding data set from Australia, they found that, in fact, death from heart disease was significantly higher. This is the closest we can come to addressing the concerns when people say, well, saturated fat will kill you. Our response can be no, because the closest studies we have, the two things we have that approach a clinical study, the Minnesota coronary experiment and the Sydney diet heart study, absolutely refute that hypothesis, which is why it wasn't published at the time. It took a reanalysis of old data that the scientists found too inconvenient in order to really find the truth of it, which was that the group eating more saturated fat lived longer, had lower mortality, and in fact, lower heart disease deaths than the group eating more linoleic acid. And then <clears throat> one last um, comment on this, was a published study just from uh, a couple, two weeks ago in the British Medical Journal. And I, uh, we will make sure this link gets in there because I wasn't intending on describing it. I just had to because the data is coming still in real time. This is absolutely a correlational study. So it's just surveys. Um, in, in this instance, it was from 21 countries involving tens of thousands of people. And they found that one of the strongest links to heart disease death and, and, and an overall death was eating refined grains. 
Now, that brings in a new angle here. I would only mention that because that further takes the attention away from saturated fat. They didn't find meat was the problem in this correlational study. It was the consumption of refined grains. And this is um, coming more from what's called the PURE study, P-U-R-E, that anyone can look up and read this. So the old paradigm, I guess to kind of wrap this up, the old paradigm that saturated fat will kill you from heart disease is based on correlational studies. This idea that you go into countries and just give people questionnaires and just sort of look 10 years later and see who died from what based on the questionnaires of what they were eating. There are tremendous problems with that, um, including people being honest and including how you're accounting for different foods. But even if you only look at correlational data, more and more correlational data refutes that old, those old conclusions from correlational data. So we can use correlational data to beat out or at least cancel out correlational data. And then as we tease through the mechanisms, as I've touched on with some of these manuscripts, and perhaps the only two clinical studies that have ever attempted to answer this question, the whole traditional dogmatic view of saturated fat and heart disease falls apart. And if fat matters, and I think it does, then it's much more likely to be a problem of polyunsaturated fats, specifically linoleic acid, the, the most primary omega-6 fat that is the likely culprit. And to those who think that they don't need it, if you are eating the bulk of your foods from uh, refined foods that are coming from bags and boxes with barcodes, almost every processed food you have in the grocery store, then it is very likely that linoleic acid is the single most commonly consumed fat in your diet. Because in the United States, soybean oil is the number one consumed fat. Shortening, which is also enriched with these, um, seed, these industrial seed oils, is number two. And we don't need any more of our fat from beef now than we did 100 years ago uh, from, from, from these fatty meats. And so even there, the correlation starts to fall apart.